Hey guys, it's Julie, and we are back for another video. And I am jumping my little two cents in to the BBL discourse. There has been so much conversation about BBLs. The BBL effect is a trend on TikTok. And we've had a bunch of discourse here on YouTube offering various critiques about the industry of BBLs. And I wanted to get into it from the lens of what is our hyperfixation? Where did we get this idea that we should be slim with ample fat only in our breasts and buttocks? And why is it problematic for one to dare have a gut? And oh my, if it hangs, how dare they? And of course we have to get into the politics of desirability that's informing us of what bodies are worthy of love. And as the BBL effect has really kicked off and it seemed to become a thing, whenever you go out, you just see them everywhere and it's kicking off a bevy of discourse why when we are critical of bbls do we often also center the desirability of our own bodies and make commentary about us actually having the acceptable realm of fat on our bodies does that even really move the conversation along is it productive but first, we have to give a thanks to our sponsors. We are back again with Setbird because baby, it is the fall. And with every new season, that means you have to rotate out your sets. We gotta get to the fall sets. You know, I'm back in school full-time in graduate school. Whoo, thank you for Setbird allowing me to be here because baby, it's a lot of work to be here right now. But I have some fall sets and as, same as last time, you can use my coupon code down in the description box below to get 30% off. Just actually, if you click the link, it'll take you right there. You'll automatically get 30% off. Your first month is only $11. It's a monthly subscription to Sense, and I love it because scents are all the rage. Everyone likes to talk about the perfumes perfumes but the perfumes can be very expensive and the little one ounce bottles is it one ounces or two point something or one point something bottles whatever however many ounces a full bottle of perfume and the perfume is it's um expensive and it's a lot of perfume as an owner of quite a few perfumes what i realized is that i had to stop buying the full bottles and actually do the scent bird and get the trial size. Try out the scents because scents that are all the rage are not gonna be the rage on my body. That may be the wrong kind of rage given off here. And so I love this idea of scent bird allowing you to try a different fragrance every month. And then if you wanna go back and buy the full size bottle, you can do it on their website. So they sent me three scents for the fall. Uh, first here, let me actually I'll open one up for you. They come in these cute little scent bird package vials. They are travel size. You can twist it um, and pull it straight out. And this one is Prada La Femme Intense. You can either pull it out or keep it right in this handy dandy travel size. These are new bottles, so you gotta pump more than once. All right. Mm, that is giving, ooh, heavy on the floral there. Ooh, yes. They do send you in the packaging cards. They give you details about the scents, the scent profile, and a QR code linking to where you can actually purchase a scent at. So the next scent that they sent me is Rachel Zoe Fearless, and it's available at Belk. That's a Charlotte-based department store, North Carolina-based. Actually, one of my classes is in the Belk, Belk School of Business. Uh, and so I think that is... This lovely white container, take it out. Oh, this is Rachel Zoe Fearless. Gonna give it a spritz, one, two, don't. Hmm, vanilla, oh no, it's coconut, turbrose, amber, oh yeah, vanilla. Look, my nose actually works. My ears might still be having lots of ear infections, but my nose, does work and i love these vials that they come in because if you do get into the travel size they uh pop off the packaging and the tops pop off very easily they tend to break and so these scent bird uh, vials that they come in add extra protection and safety you can throw it in your purse travel with you and yeah i do use these i do love these and i love smelling like a very wealthy mm. are we giving pumpkin spice autumn alabama sorority girl teas mm, no no, I think you know more of a Northeast girl, to be honest. North Jersey, Italian, in my rustic kitchen, <laughs> and gaudy little mansion, McMansion. That's what I'm giving here with these scents, and I love them absolutely. All right, 
Cheers. Thanks to Setbird. All the details are in the description box and pinned in the first, the top comment. Let's get into this discussion. So I've already gone over the questions that I'm looking to get into in this video and what I am personally trying to add to the discourse around BBLs. But first, we always have to give history and context. So what is a BBL? Colloquially, it actually stands for Brazilian butt lift, though the current form of the procedure is not technically a procedure that was developed in Brazil or popularized in Brazil. And let's just get into the actual details of the history. Ivo Pitanguai, oh, I am sorry if I butcher this man's name, we gonna put some text in the screen to help you out, but if I don't know Portuguese, okay? Brazilian plastic surgeon, hmm, that's him, who is widely credited for the BBL, though the technique is not the uh, butt augmentation that includes fat transfer that we use today. So 1964, a uh, paper was published, and I'm looking down at my notes if I keep looking down here, I'm trying to say factual, actual. But a paper was published in 64 on butt lift surgery, which removed excess skin and tissue to correct sagging. Now, while this method tightened and toned, it did not increase volume or projection. Then in 1969, a group of doctors published a case study on a butt augmentation procedure that used a silicone implant to correct a trophy. So this is considered a, well, I don't know the technical term. So when it's a medical to fix a medical issue, it's not a cosmetic surgery is essentially what I'm saying. So a trophy is when you have a decrease or a lessening and typically like if you Google it, it'll talk about like the calf. It'll talk about like the calf muscle. So like you lose that bit of muscle at the top of your calf and then it starts to concave in. That's what a trophy is considered. Then in 1973, the first purely cosmetic butt augmentation surgery kicked off the commercial development of butt lifts. <laughs> and butt specific implants. Then in 1980s, liposuction becomes more popular. So the medical procedure, the technique is developed and it becomes a viable body contouring surgery. Then in the 1990s, plastic surgeon Sidney Coleman published a series of papers outlining standardized practices for what we now know as the BBL. And I guess since it was at first a Brazilian doctor who popularized the idea of a butt augmentation, I wanna say the term amalgamated, but the term became, it went from Brazilian butt lifts to BBLs. Some of us were around in the 90s and into the early 2000s. There definitely was an uptick of discussions about BBLs, though I don't know, were they called? Were they even really called BBLs? I think from my understanding, and this is anecdotal, this is not necessarily like a historical fact, but from what I remember, there was talks about butt injections and butt lifts and BBLs were distinguished as the, the plastic surgeon procedure that you could get done, not the injections that you were going to, you know, the, the black market back alleys to get done. In the early 2000s, there was a lot of discussion around the deaths that were happening and the medical trauma that women and femmes who were going to get off market butt implants were facing. And now in the 2020s, what we understand these injections are as polymer and silicone injections. Now there's a new story I'm thinking about specifically about this person that was injecting cement and fix a flat into butts. We've seen this parody in Spike Lee films, it's popped up in media where jokes have been made about it. In more recent 2020s history, there are have also been celebrity women who have discussed having polymers and also the fallout that comes from it. So like a Jada Waida, a Dream Doll, I believe Cardi B also discussed having butt injections or not having the proper kind of procedure done and discouraging women from doing it the way she did it. And essentially what these injections are, are that consumers are false, falsely told that they are receiving an FDA approved dermal filler, but they are actually injected with silicone. And Dream Doll went on to discuss having hers removed. Jada talked about having illegal ones because she did not have enough body fat. And I haven't really heard in the more recent times, these injections um, discussed as a positive 
procedure. You know, like I think there's been times where I've heard people talk about doing things, you know, the back alley, the off market way, whether it's veneers or various other cosmetic procedures and then being like, I did it, I did it, it is what it is, kind of like that eh, 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 approach. I put one shoulder up, put the other shoulder up, put them down. We don't care. I'm never going to stop saying that. But um, with polymers, every time I've heard it talked about with the in butt injections, it has almost always been talked about that they would never do it again, that they've had to then have the surgery. They've had to have some sort of surgery or procedure to remove or to deal with the after or the impact of it. And so thankfully, it does very much so feel like we have moved away from women and femmes trying to pursue butt injections. We've left that alone because it ain't worth the complications. Now, BBLs themselves are still very complicated surgeries. By some standards, the death rate is one of the highest rates for any aesthetic procedure. At one point in time, the death rate was considered one in 3,000. It was according to a group of plastic surgery societies. They put out a paper in 2015. That number was then later updated to one in 14,952, a very specific number. But it's only that specific number when performed by a board certified surgeon. And this is according to the Aesthetic Surgery Education and Research Foundation. Now, a board certified cosmetic surgeon is not the same thing as a board certified plastic surgeon. They do not meet the same standard. And so for anyone wanting to do anything to their bodies, you should always very thoroughly, please do your research. I think what has fueled a lot of this discussion around BBLs has been viral videos that show the medical tourism that has cropped up specifically around butt augmentation surgeries. And we've pivoted, you know, so now that we've pivoted from these sort of black market butt injections to BBLs, it's becoming more accessible both in American society and in, the Dominican Republic, Colombia, and other countries. Um, I think it's it's quite fascinating, right? There is something to be said about how BBLs have become a more accessible procedure, and it's relatively feasible for many of us to save over time the money for a one-off procedure and the immediate aftercare, which can range roughly from 7,000 to 12,000. Those are really rough estimates. I know, please don't come for me too, too hard with these. But we still come back to an American society where most of us do not have access to quality health insurance. Long-term impacts of these very complicated surgeries when we can afford the one surgery, we can afford the immediate aftercare, but can you afford the long-term care that might come with achieving this quote unquote snatched body? And I know it's really easy, right? It's so easy to wanna like dunk and make jokes and make quips about these videos of women lined up in wheelchairs at the Santa Domingo and Miami airports. But I, I, I think before we y'all y'all get too quick about cracking a joke, why are women actually going to the DR and Columbia to get the work done? Because I think a lot of the jokes wanna make a comment about people being broke or not having money and this idea that going out of the country immediately means that you were doing something way cheaper. Um, and this is actually where we kind of get into like the politics of desirability, of beauty, and I'm not talking electoral politics, but politics, the word politics actually means a set of activities that are associated with making decisions in groups and other forms of power relations between individuals, such as distribution of resources or status. That is what I mean when I say we are gonna get into the politics of any given topic. So yeah, let us dig in a little bit to the politics of beauty, desirability, and fat phobia. So as I already mentioned, it's not necessarily finances that are driving the international medical tourism around BBLs that you see a lot of people going to the DR in Colombia. It's actually what is our ideals of what is a snatched, desirable, and a body that I'm gonna keep saying, I'm talking about bodies that are worthy of love. There, There is a 
a sector of women and femmes who are pursuing BBLs because they want their body to be desired. They want the attention, they want the social currency, and they also want this feeling of love and safety and care, like they want to be seen. And they believe that unless they have a specific prototype of a body, that, that the body that they currently exist in cannot be seen in a meaningful way way. On the other side of this BBL discourse has also come where people are quick to antagonize other women claiming that they've had BBLs and not only going after and antagonize women saying that, oh, because you have this certain proportions, because you have wide hips, because you have a certain shape behind that you've had a BBL, but not only have you had a BBL, but you've had a botched or insufficient, or the wrong kind of BBL. So if a woman does have big hips and a butt, but have has hip dips, which is pretty much how you tell that somebody has like a natural type body, where you have a roll of fat at the base of your waistline, the top of your hips, it concaves in and then the rest of the fat kind of expands out as it meets your thighs. And this is not to say that these women necessarily have big butts or whatever, or that their bodies are more desirable, but it's just a natural shape if you carry any fat on your body is that you're going to have hip dips. And now women are being accused of having BBLs even when they just have wide hips and not necessarily a big butt. And then we're going after women and antagonizing them about whether they've had the sufficient or right kind of BBL. Why did you waste your time and go get a butt augmentation surgery and your butt doesn't appear to be a certain proportion to your body? We have on so many levels reinvested in a hierarchy of beauty that is always entangled with the ideals of white supremacy. They're like so much of our beauty standards, no matter how how far, no matter how far we think we've gotten away from it, are entangled with white supremacy. And I'm gonna get into that more later. But I wanted to talk about the fat transfer allowances that are allowed in different country that has led to the boom of medical tourism because there also is this belief that you should get a, that you should have a certain amount of volume once you do the surgery. And that also increases the risk for most folks. And the other side of this, we spent, we can spend so much time talking specifically about like the butt augmentation surgery, but it's also that people that might have a more rounded proportion um, in their butt and thighs, but also have the appropriate gut to go with it are having that tummy tucked. And so they can get away with also feeding into this prototype of desirability of the body that is allowed to be seen and loved and say, oh, well, I didn't get a BBL. Am I better than you? I just got a tummy tuck. <laughs> okay. In the USA, the limits of fat transfer uh, that can be removed in one sitting, that's only 4,000 cc's of fat that may be removed during liposuction, which equals seven to eight pounds. Then if a patient is having more than one procedure, such as a BBL and tummy tuck, you can only remove 1,000 cc's of fat. Um, and I don't know, how much like how much more technical doctors can get with that say, say you know Miami Atlanta LA are the hot spots for plastic surgery and so it's going to vary state to state and doctors might be able to get away with how they code their procedures to allow to work around the state regulations but it's pretty much known that in the United States there is a distinct limit to how much fat can be removed and therefore inserted during one procedure. There's no regulations about how much fat can be inserted back into your body, but it's really more about how much fat can be removed that then can be used to reinsert into your buttocks. Colombia and the Dominican Republic have no government regulation. The caveat is that the DR in 2019 released a transitory resolution by the Ministry of Public Health and an official effort to guarantee patient safety in aesthetic plastic surgeries in the country. And so the DR does about 21 of their 56 plastic surgery centers are licensed. I'm not really clear about what all goes into a DR plastic surgery center being licensed, but obviously if you were interested in pursuing the surgeries, 
the research. It's all there for you. Now, if you follow any of the surgery IG pages, they all talk about the very distinct differences between a Colombian done body, which tends to be more extreme and its proportions, than if you get it done in Miami with a certain doctor, you get it done in Atlanta with a certain doctor, you get it done in the DR with a certain doctor. The extreme body proportions where you get the wide butt, the thick thighs, or just the wide butt, the skinny thighs, and a really tiny waistline are often attributed to Colombian doctors. But again, when we get back to this ideal of who's telling you that your what your body has to look like in order to be desirable and therefore seen and protected and loved, because we have to get to the root of what people are really getting at here. Who's setting these standards? And are they being honest about what they are getting done to their bodies and the complications that come with it? Because the truth of the matter is that BBLs and most plastic surgery, whether you do liposuction, you do tummy tucks, whatever, Botox even, these are not one and done procedures. You can save up one time to get the surgery done to get the aftercare that goes into it, to the travel costs, whatever, to attain this complicated surgery. But the truth is most of the people who are setting the standard for what desirable bodies are supposed to be are getting two and three surgeries done before they reach the peak of the body that they desire and then constantly going back in for maintenance. Specifically with BBLs, it does, it often takes about two to three procedures to achieve, let's say, the young Miami physique. And then you can look at a Nicki Minaj, a Kim Kardashian, uh, various other women who were early participators in butt augmentation. And there have been time periods where they have been made fun of, gotten dragged, for unedited photos of their butts making it to the internet. And then some shortly thereafter, they go in for their maintenance surgery. To speak to the celebrity influence of plastic surgery, celebrity and influencers, especially so many of the women who have uh, buoyed up this market. And you know, we could talk about the Kardashians all day long. We can talk about the various Instagram models. We can talk about the Instagram celebrities and influencers, but these women and these femmes are getting the surgery and still relying on Photoshop and filters to post bodies. Like this, these surgeries are not really enhancing the confidence of any person. I understand that people often, when you want to have any discourse about public surgery, are very quick to say that if somebody wants to do something to their body, let them. You have every right to change your body. And by all means, you do have the autonomy to do it. But I don't want to necessarily encourage a discourse that we then take to antagonize other women, which is why I'm also calling out the antagonization, right? I, I think it's very unethical and mean to go about and be the accusation police about who you believe has had a BBL or not and whether the BBL is acceptable to your standards or not. I want us to be able to, whether we're thinking about it ourselves, whether we're just at a position where our body dysmorphia, because social media has absolutely caused body dysmorphia for many of us, that we are able to be have, with even with ourselves, have a critical discourse about what's motivating our desire to change our bodies. And if we are ready for the complications that will come with a change that might present itself at, in a physical manner, but comes with all these other internal issues on top of that. As I've already said, most of our beauty standards are deeply impacted by white supremacy and capitalism. Beauty standards are ev constantly evolving based on what we can be sold on. Any new beauty trend always comes with a bevy of products at our disposal for us to purchase. BBLs, obviously, tummy, tummy tucks, liposuction, they require plastic surgery, not cheap. Botox, fillers, waist trainers, even this idea of clear skin. And you know, we get this onslaught of beauty products and things that we can spend our money on, but we do not get the social and systemic equity to have, a, you know, basic quality, decent lives. 
is, right? Like, you know, when we, and I keep, I, I, you know, yeah, we're talking about plastic surgery, right? So what does that have to do with social equity and systemic and human rights, right? But when you think about the, the, the wide, vast of aesthetic procedures you can get done to make your body more desirable that are also in the canon of what's motivating BBLs, what's motivating liposuction and tummy tucks. It's also that like a, a lot of the ways your body appears physically are impacted by your lifestyle. And it's not, oh, go on a diet and eat better, but like, do you have access to rest? Can you de-stress? Like how stressful is your life? What what food do you have access to? Do you live in a food desert? Which <laughs> many of us do. Do you have access to quality health care? Can you even, ch you know, everyone wants to talk about Megan knees, but like the cartilage in your knees. I don't need you to twerk. I just need a body weight. And that it even ain't about a, a, a physical, about having a certain amount of weight, but you can be a very thin presenting person and because we do not have access to quality healthcare, you have worn down the cartilage in your knees because of the way your hips rotate. And I'm saying this as a person because like my hips rotate a certain way. And so I've had to get, I've gotten access to medical care and then realize how expensive it is just to maintain a functioning healthy body. I don't think I could ever really go <laughs> under the knife just because I have gone through the process of thinking, oh, I have good health insurance. Let me like get all these things, do all these things to take care of my body. And then realizing even with that, it's still wildly expensive. And there's also just a lot of lacking research when it, particularly for women and particularly for black women, when it comes to taking care of our bodies. And then you get into all different sorts of ailments that we are quietly struggling with that cannot be fixed by traveling to another country to get a cosmetic procedure done. What does it mean when we live in a society where many of us do not have access to quality medical care to actually take care of our bodies, but the black body has always been commodified in the Western world. And therefore beauty standards of various black communities, whether African or black American or whatever in the diaspora, but any community that has had a history of experiencing European colonialism, that the tentacles of white supremacy will constantly replicate to rear their ugly head. And it especially rears its ugly head in our beauty standards. And that's where we land with this idea of featureism. If we understand that certain features are seen as more desirable when it comes to the face, slender nose, slightly pump lips, you know, an angular face, a lean face. Uh, and so we see this representation of black women, we see the representation of dark skinned black women, but they all have small slender features. And we're still replicating this ideal that wide and big noses, that large lips, that full faces and you know if you're you don't have you could have high cheekbones but if they overwhelm your face whatever you know what i'm getting at that this more mm, what's it what's the term i've seen used before some people want to defy it as a more bantu to get ethnic terms but i don't know if we really have any language well i know we don't have app language to discuss race and so when we try to talk about the beauty standards that are embedded in within a rate within race you know, it gets real murky, it gets real hard. And it becomes really easy to say, well, that doesn't apply to me. And I know this one case and I know this other outlier. And because we don't have the language and be, it just, in, and because we don't have the language, it makes it really impossible to have a productive conversation that goes far on this topic. But that don't mean we can't keep trying and that doesn't mean that we can't keep working to develop the language to talk about it. But I wanna go back to the capitalism point, right? Because beauty standards evolve. What is defined as desirable is constantly evolving based on what we can be sold on. And if the black body and the Western world has always been commodified, in particularly in the United States of America, we have always existed as a people where our bodies are commodified, right? Our bodies are the labor, our bodies are the utility. And then even when it comes to our sexuality, when it comes to how we feed into the ideals of womanhood and even motherhood, our bodies are still 
commodified, even when we think about, oh, how can I make myself desirable? Oh, well, it's what can I do to my body? What can I buy to change my body? And what I see happening in this industry of, of plastic surgery that has become more popular, particularly for black women in America, is that there's also this belief that if you can become physically desirable and maybe it's ex the, what's accessible to you is having the proportions of a large butt and minimal fat elsewhere and large breasts or fat only in specific places or at least a flat stomach regardless of how wide you are, that that is going to get you more capital that either people believe getting a BBL will get them more engagement and more opportunities towards a wealthier lifestyle. That somehow they could beat the capitalistic system by playing into the capitalism and buying into the beauty products and buying into the beauty procedures and then that they will then become wealthy. Be but what really happens, what's re you know, what you're trying to do is again, are you being seen? Is your body deemed as worthy? And we are conflating these ideals of becoming desirable, right? Becoming cared about. This is not really care, but you you put this feeling of care comes through likes and engagement and attention. And then that attention then means you're gonna make money. I think if TikTok has shown you nothing else, it's that people can have a lot of followers that you can become discoverable based on a many of things. And that don't mean you're gonna make more money. I know on Instagram and because the industry of in influencers has actually become a thing, I think there's a lot more to interrogate in this idea that people think they either on one hand can get a, get a butt augmentation, get the tummy tuck, get whatever it is they need to get in order to have a flat stomach and a fat butt, and that means that they will become desired. And whether the desire means more money, whether that desire means love, protection, and safety, for most of us, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, you know, capitalism always, especially neo, <laughs> you know, I wanna get into all these technical terms, but maybe don't worry too much about it. But, you know, neoliberalism, the system will always reshape itself to tell you that you are the one that needs fixing while being the system, by, while being a corrupt system itself. And it's exceptionalism that allows certain individuals to become very popular and portray a certain lifestyle that's all we should all know of the side and telling you that this is attainable if you just buy these things. You see, it, capitalism is just a tangled web. It, it ain't, once, you, once you dip into it, it really ain't no way to get back out of it. And so we are always getting sold on a bevy of things that are telling you, you are that wrong thing, baby. You are the wrong thing, but buy this thing and you might be a little less wrong. Mm. Okay, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was the use of Sarah Bartman and the African stereotype of having a big butt. This kind of connects to the question and you know, really point that I started with at the beginning of the video of the current discourse around BBLs, especially when it's critical on any platform, on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, where I've seen people talk about butt augmentations and tummy tucks and plastic surgery in a critical way. People are always really quick to center their own bodies in the conversation. I do think there is a utility of personalizing the conversation and talking about your own body dysmorphia, especially if we are being criticals of the surgeries, but to then move into the, well, I got a butt, I ain't got that problem. Well, I got the booty, ain't need to do it. You know, <laughs> I ain't never thought about it because I got a butt. Like all, you know, this, this reaffirming this idea that to be black, um, to be of African descent, means that you have to have a big butt. And I know people love to bring up the image of Sarah Bartman, uh, Venus Hot and Tight, and talk about how the image of black woman was once used to defame us but now we can defend a very specific body type and that we should be able to understand that defense in the history of Sarah Bartman. Now, I do think, obviously, anytime you talk about 
the black body and the history around beauty standards and the politics of desirability, that Sarah Bartman is a huge part of that discourse. Actually, Sabrina Strings in Fearing the Black Body and the Radical Origins of Fat Phobia, she, she's breaking down the history of beauty standards. There's an art history discourse in the book. There's a political history. There's a lot of information. It's a really good book. Uh, but she also talks about Sarah Bartman and the Venus image and the Jezebel image and how this woman whose image we've often seen and has somehow in some way proportionally represented the, the body, the black body that we should be in defense of was of a very specific ethnic group, right? They were, whoop, can I, can I pronounce this rightly, please? I apologize for my colonized tongue, but the Koi Koi from the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And not every ethnic group in the very large continent of Africa is going to have the same stature or even similar body types that are represented in the image of Sarah Bartman. I think it is very dubious that we have taken the idea of that like, yes, there is a difference to the various African bodies, especially as slave trade spread throughout Europe. That, I mean, there's like, I'm not, I don't wanna get too tongue tied here cause I didn't really put this in my outline, but I'm thinking of Bell Hooks. Um, she has a book called Black Looks also that talks about beauty standards and beauty standards in the Western society are almost always built on the idea of othering. Who can be othered outside of those standards? And so when we have standards built on white supremacy and capitalism and that they have commodified and absorbed certain features of the black body, it's, it's going to be very specific features and then they become the features of the African people. And it somehow erases the diversity that the continent of Africa actually holds. Am I making sense though? Is it making sense though? A body type that has an ample behind, but also exists fat in other places in the body. And it's not just the breast and the butt, but it's also a round stomach, it's round thighs, it's round calves, but that have in proportion to that also have ample butts. That is a sub-Saharan African feature, but it is not the sub-Saharan African feature because even when we say sub-Saharan Africa, the continent of Africa is huge. There are many ethnic groups, even within South Africa where Sarah Bartman was taken from and kidnapped from, there are so many ethnic groups that exist in the Southern region of Africa and people have various statures and various physiques and that somehow we have whittled down this one feature to say, if you don't have it, are you really black? Does such harm to a multitude of black women and femmes? And that we have relegated this ideal to how we can be an acceptable and a desirable and a beautiful type of black woman means that we must have a butt, a butt that's, you know, so many people feed into the, you know, showing their behind as a valuable part of their body. This adds value, this adds social currency to me because I can turn around and it's plump. It's a really wild concept because if I turn around and it's plump right there too, that's unacceptable. Why are we trying to kill ourselves like this? Why are we trying to kill ourselves like this? Like, please body, only direct the fat to one, two, one, two, nowhere else. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? You know what, am I, am I trying to tell everyone to divest from showing their butts as a, a value status? Kinda. Or to be a little bit more conscious of it. How quick are we when people are coming for us or antagonizing us, are we to say, oh, but I got this, as if somehow that does something to negate the hate? It's very, you know, 
I've had to think about it. I've had to think about it because I see it happen often. And what are we then feeding into when we feed into this value system that says to have that fat in a very specific area of our body while not having fat elsewhere is what makes us desirable, is what warrants us to be loved. Like how, how you know, can we just be a little bit more cautious when we feed into these things? You know, going back to the fearing the black body, Sabrina Strings does b bring up that when she starts off, she does this like history, the art history of how beauty standards even came to be defined through European artists and intellectual thinkers. Uh, and she, she connects it to that as the African slave trade exploded and Africans came into Europe as enslaved people, that that was how our beauty standards became entangled with essentially a racial language that commodifies certain aspects of the black body while largely denoting the black body as ugly, as unwarranted. And when we get into featureism, she does also talk in the book about how in like the early 17th, not the necessarily early, but like I'm saying you know, 17th century is hella early, 17th century that these European men were distinguishing between various ethnic groups in Africa that were being captured between which ones had desirable features and that desirability was based on which ethnic group had the closer phenotype facial features to what European standards defined as beautiful. So slender noses, only slightly plump lips, you know, angular faces, things that I've already said earlier in the video. And I think this is why when, you know, when I say we don't have the language to discuss, productively discuss race, it also muddies the way we could productively have conversations about the standards of beauty and desirability because you know what is a eurocentric feature right it, it's you can't use eurocentric to apply to features that black people have because it's not eurocentric that's like you know the propensity of south sudanese models in the fashion industry it's not eurocentric that a certain ethnic group within sudan is known to have slanted eyes and small petite facial features it's, it's very African, it's very African, but we understand what the featureism is there and why that ethnic group is more represented than other ethnic groups. And then when we do get other ethnic groups represented, they still have very slender features. They still fit in to a binary that we don't have the language to clearly define, but we know it exists. And we have an understanding that anything that exists outside of this box that we don't have the language to define, but we know exists is deemed as unwanted, as undesirable and undeserving of love. And I think that's what's really rooting this uptick of women getting BBLs. Why it's dubious to say, well, I have, I don't have to get it done because I was blessed, God gave me whatever, is because there are black women who genuinely believe, and it's not even that they believe it because they got this in their heads on their own, but have been told that they're undeserving, that their bodies are unwanted. They've been made fun of, they've been, they've experienced casual trauma, they've experienced harm. People have poked and prodded and come at their bodies in very offensive ways. And it's not like I'm saying people as if it's like the man or like the over there. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about how we talk to each other, how we engage with each other and how we make each other feel. That that's why I, I don't think there's any productivity and I wanna caution people when they ever have these discourses and they wanna be critical or they you know wanna incite critical thought into this discourse to not rely on personalizing the desirability of your own body. Because what does it mean to be in this world as a black woman and told that certain physical markers are the definition of a black woman and you don't have those markers? Mm, you know? And if we're beginning to understand featureism though, shouldn't we understand that featureism goes beyond just the physical features of somebody's face? That it also goes into the body types that we define as the bodies that can be loved? Hmm. 
that's all I have for today. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below, respectfully. Maybe we can always come back for another part of this conversation. The beauty conversation is so complicated, it's so layered. There's so many notes and things that we can still get into and go on here, but babes, the BBL effect. <laughs> Wanted to touch on it. <laughs> I hope you enjoy. Deuces.